Well, dear friends, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm uh, Greg Scarlatio, Executive Director of the U.S. Committee for Human Rights in North Korea, based in Washington, D.C. Let me begin by welcoming our board members, uh, John Dupre, co-vice chair of the board, uh, Ambassador Robert King, former special envoy for um, uh, North Korean human rights, uh, Colonel David Maxwell, um, many um, um, other friends and uh, board members, of course, uh, Marcus Noland of the Peterson Institute, Bill Newcomb, um, uh, so many other friends. Thank you for joining us today. I'm very pleased to welcome our two speakers. Um, I'm often asked, uh, uh, what does uh, U.S. Uh, academia, what do professors in the U.S. and elsewhere do to highlight North Korean human rights issues? The millions of uh, men and women, brothers and sisters, who are being brutalized by a vicious regime. And uh, the example I always give is that of uh, Professor Sandra Fahey and Professor Lee sung -yun. They're terrific academics and they're terrific champions of this great cause. Um, let me begin by uh, introducing them. Of course, uh, Professor Sandra Fahey is currently with uh, Sophia University in Tokyo, Japan. Um, she holds her doctoral degree from University of London. Uh, she specializes in sociocultural anthropology, medical anthropology of food, health, migration, refugees, war, militarism, violence, linguistic anthropology of trauma, memory, governmentality, censorship, testimony, state media, you have it, human rights theory and practice. We know her, um, all of us as, uh, as students of uh, North Korean human rights, we, we, we know her as the author of uh, two landmark books, Dying for Rights, putting North Korea's rights abuses on the record, um, of course. Um, and um, she's the, the, the author of multiple articles and also another landmark book, Marching Through Suffering, published by Columbia University Press in 2015. Um, Professor Lee song Yun is uh, way too young to be my, uh, my grandmaster, but he is. He was my professor at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and for the better or the worse, um, he is responsible for the man I am today. And um, he's been a great friend and mentor for close to two decades. Well, it's been two decades. He's a Kim Gu Korea Foundation professor of Korean studies and also assistant professor at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, Tufts University. He's a faculty associate at the Program on U.S.-Japan Relations at the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs at Harvard University. Uh, he's a widely published author. Um, we've read his pieces and articles in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the LA Times, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, the Christian Science Monitor. Uh, of course, he's a regular contributor to The Hill. Um, he's currently writing a book, and that's a big surprise on a, on a key member of the North Korean royal family. I cannot wait to read his book. He's uh, such a terrific academic uh, writer, thought leader. So is Sandra. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm going to invite Sandra, Professor Fahey, to take the floor first and address the current North Korean human rights situation. Then we're going to move on to uh, Professor Lee and um, ask him to uh, address South Korea's role, the current state of South Korean politics and the impact on North Korean human rights. Um, I'm going to give it my best shot to uh, making a few comments on uh, South Korea's role within the international community addressing uh, North Korean human rights. So Sandra, on to you, please go ahead. 
Thank you, Greg. Um, thank you, all the staff at HRNK. Thank you, Professor Lee. It's my honor to be here with you and all of the people who are attending. Um, it's my great privilege to be able to speak on behalf of my fellows in North Korea. You've asked me to speak about the current human rights situation. And as I was preparing for my talk today, I, I thought sort of tongue in cheek, well, I mean, I could easily just go to documents that are set from the 1960s and 70s and say, well, this is the current situation because as we know, so little has really changed in North Korea. However, globally, things have changed for all of us. Um, we've had crackdowns on our borders, all of us. And the way that this impacts our North Korean fellows is um, more severe, of course, than the way it impacts us. So I thought obviously the most important thing I could speak about today would be the coronavirus situation in North Korea. And um, the source that I'm going to for this information is um, Asia Press's Rim Jin Gang, R-I-M-J-I-N-G-A-N-G uh, is, the, is the spelling in English. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about this group because they do work on basically underground journalism in North Korea. So we're able to get this information in relatively real time. They're working with North Korean covert journalists on the ground to record, to collect information from people. So this is incredibly valuable to us. And uh, I just want to be open about that source. So North Korea basically takes a two track approach and we know this Pretty much, this is how North Korea does. In my opinion, everything, a two-track approach. What they're gonna show you internationally and what's really going on behind the scenes, right? So publicly, North Korea claims, I think I'm happy to be corrected, but publicly, North Korea claims to have zero cases of COVID-19. So this is absolutely the land of miracles um, since blocking its border with China in March of 2020. But this is absolutely not the case. How do we know that this is not the case? Well, in fact, the most important person in the land has said internally that this is not the case. <laughs> so at a July 25th, 2020 emergency meeting of the Political Bureau of the Central Committee of the Workers' Party, Kim Jong-un said the following. And we have this information from a document that was leaked. It's a seven page document. It's called, quote, the words of Kim Jong-un at the tw July 25th emergency meeting. And he said the following, despite the fact that strong emergency quarantine measures have been taken throughout the country over the past six months. Now remember, this is July 25th, 2020, we have ultimately not been able to block the entry of the coronavirus at our borders. And yet, internally as well, uh, October 10th, Kim Jong-un declared victory over the coronavirus. So crackdowns are still happening throughout North Korea. What kind of impact is this having on the people? I'm gonna turn my attention to that now. So, you know, some people might say this is less relevant, this isn't a huge issue, but it's, it's one of the measures that we have in terms of Japan and North Korea ties. They've been severed by the coronavirus. Any of you who've tried to post anything, for instance, from Japan, there's, there've been several countries that we haven't been able to post materials to. So they have lost contact with relatives for over a year due to the postal stop. And we're talking about ethnic Koreans who are here in Japan who are unable to get in touch with their relatives back up north. Now, as I mentioned, all countries are tightening their borders, but this means something very different in the case of North Korea. Um, in, uh, Kim Jong-un has tightened its control, his control over the country in response to the pandemic, and life for local residents has severely worsened, so much so that severely impoverished people have attempted to escape to China through the strict border security zone. Of course, you'll be aware that it's on both sides now. While some have been arrested while fleeing, others have been shot and killed. And in fact, a proclamation in the name of the police um, has been uh, screenshotted by uh, Rim Jin Gang. And it says that they would unconditionally, I'm quoting, shoot anyone approaching the border. And in fact, I think they even say any animals approaching the border will also be shot, anything basically living. It also stated that there would be a nighttime curfew in the border area um, and that people wouldn't be able to go out after 6 p.m. Now in the case of North Korea, this is very intense because what does it mean economically for people? So people are trying to escape or commit suicide because they're being hounded by their debt collectors. All of us have been e impacted economically by the coronavirus 
And in the case of North Korea, it's no different, but perhaps more severe. So the debt collectors these days, this is a quotation from somebody inside North Korea. The debt collectors these days are really scary. They come to your house and take all of your household goods, even your kettle. If a person is cornered to that degree, it's understandable they might consider defecting or committing suicide. And in fact, due to this debt collection, there have been more cases of, um, well, the document called them gochebi, but really it's homeless individuals. And gochebi usually, in my understanding, refers to children, orphan children, but um, more homeless that are traveling around North Korea. There was an internal document discussing this. So the resident organization is telling North Koreans to fight internally, meaning solve the problem yourselves uh, because the government is blocking the border. Now, those of us who know North Korea know that this is not new, <laughs> um, that even during the famine, it was solve the problem yourselves. And basically, as I like to say, again, tongue in cheek, basically North Koreans are expected to subsist on ideology alone. And as we know, ideology is not very nourishing. So uh, to continue the quote, we have no medicine, no food and no firewood for heating or cooking. People are just expected to stay inside their houses and somehow survive on the air. Now, I just wanna provide some trade statistics. I'm not an economist, but this was quite interesting to me and I'm coming quite close to the end of my talking points here. The trade statistics released by China's customs authorities at the end of November, 2020 were shocking. The total value of imports and exports between North Korea and China in October was 1,659,000 US, which was a 99.4 drop down from the same period last year. The value of North Korean imports was only 253,000, so down by 99.9%. Um, there's been obviously a drop in uh, access to foreign currency as a result of the border being closed. So just a few more points here that the um, individuals who are passing away due to COVID-19. Well, we can't be entirely certain what the cause of death is, but authorities are saying that they have died of tuberculosis. As we know, tuberculosis is quite rampant in North Korea. Multiple drug resistant TB is also quite rampant. Um, and so they're saying they died of tuberculosis. And this is quite similar to what happened during the famine. The North Korean authorities saying individuals died from food poisoning or high blood pressure and things like this, absolutely untrue. Um, so there have been some scuffles between riot police in North Korea and uh, protesters. And here's another quote from an individual inside North Korea. Many of the protesters are elderly. Uh, one man with a chronic illness heard about the lockdown and he went outside and started screaming, kill me, drawing attention, the attention of many people and causing riot poli police to be mobilized. You can imagine this elderly man um, just reached his absolute breaking point. Now here's an important point, and this is something I found from my own research during the famine and since. The elderly are not criticizing Kim Jong-un, they are complaining that the party officials in the provinces and cities are making false reports and are trying to starve the people with a lockdown instead of properly reporting the true levels of destitution. It's not a direct criticism of the government. So this is something that I have seen in my own research, I'm sure you've all seen it. Um, now, length of military service has also shrunk in North Korea in the last little while. This is quite interesting to think about. Um, my, this is my final point. Um, within the military, things are quite dire. It's often been the case. And uh, with the crackdowns on the border, it's become the case uh, more intensely. So soldiers are not only forbidden to leave their units, but they are also uh, forbidden to have contact with the public. So we're seeing um, that soldiers are deserting the military in the hope that they will not be chased and killed. This is quite an interesting development to see. So I'll leave my talking points there. Thank you so much. I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Well, Professor Fahey, thank you so much. And before I turn it over to Professor Lee, uh, I'm extraordinarily pleased to be joined by uh, Ambassador Yi Jiang Tsun as well. Uh, and of course, also my mother, Dr. Elena Scarlatti, who's tuned in. Um, Yun, Professor Lee, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Uh, some uh, very interesting and exciting developments in South Korea. So uh, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Greg, and the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea for all the good work, the great work that you do, and for this opportunity. If we, if the world were able to see beyond the ever so morose, 
macabre, endlessly mockable morphology that is the political construct known as the DPRK, the Despotic People's Republic of Korea, we shall see, we should be able to see that beyond this unique amalgamation of medieval mores and buffoonish bellicosity lies a very clever, a very calculating dictator, entirely adept in the art of strategic deception, as well as the family business of nuclear extortion. We should be able to see that Kim Jong-un has agency and doesn't just merely react to external stimuli, whether it's a message of civility, I don't know, of, um, for example, an unconventional love affair, illicit and epistolary as favored by the former US president, or whether it's a message of hostility, you know, the fiery and furious kind as uh, pronounced by the same former US president, or an outright attack on basic freedoms, unconstitutional gag on free speech as preferred by the current president, of South Korea, the self-proclaimed sole legitimate Korean government in the entire Korean peninsula, representing the people in the entire Korean peninsula. The presumption that refraining from criticizing North Korea's human rights violations, its manifold crimes against humanity, which are unique in their scale, nature, severity as the UN Commission of Inquiry report, the landmark 400 page, 372 page report published in 2014 notes, I would add duration also. The scale, the nature, the severity and the duration of North Korea's crimes against humanity are unparalleled in our modern world in the, in the post 1945 era. Despite such grim reality, some of us want to believe that if we raise human rights issues vis-a-vis -vis North Korea, that might derail progress, uh, the process of peace negotiation, denuclearization, and so on, all those good things. As if North Korea is so brittle, so paranoid, so proud that North Korea would just walk away from these negotiations, which have, benefited North Korea entirely, overwhelmingly over the past three decades. It's been a, an excellent business model. North Korea has been able, able to reap from the world's biggest nations, tens of billions of dollars in concessions, including cash, food, fuel, and other blandishments. North Korea wants to keep this game going and we have entered a new cycle of North Korean provocations, calculated provocations this spring. Over the past, various DPRK friendly South Korean administrations have used, misused um, North Korea's grinding poverty, the famine, the ongoing food insecurity situation. It's an impressive feat. It's a unique feat for an industrialized, urbanized, literate society to undergo a famine as North Korea did in the mid to late 1990s. This is a first and probably shall always remain a unique feat. And over the past three decades, since the onset of the famine, North Korea has without fail been ranked, if you will, in the world's top five food insecurity, food um, dep deprivation, hungry nations um, by the UN index of the prevalence of undernourishment as a percentage of the total population. You look at the top 10 list, top 20 list, no country is industrialized and completely literate and armed with nuclear weapons and ICBMs. So, North Korea is poor, the people are hungry, wet while the regime lives like multi-billionaires. The top leaders, the Kim Jong-un and his family and the regime elites have a good life, a life of luxury, privilege, while the vast majority of the population are politically, 
and economically, socially discriminated against. And during a pandemic, such political injustices become all the more apparent. Um, a pandemic, unlike a famine, can kill without prejudice, both princes and paupers alike. But in a famine, no rich person, no powerful person ever goes hungry. No king ever dies in a famine. It's the politically marginalized that become the first natural victims of the deeply entrenched political inequalities in a system like North Korea. So for the South Korean administration to say, and they have since the early 2000s, that in North Korea, because the people are poor and hungry, economic rights take precedence over political rights. The people have to eat, they have to survive, right? So we should not raise human rights vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. Instead, we should give them aid. That simple argument seemed to make sense to me for about 15 seconds. And then I came to realize, thanks to, uh, in part, the great work that HRNK does, for example, Robert Collins's study, Marked for Life, Songbun, the socio-political classification system of North Korea published some 10 years ago, we know that North, every North Korean newborn is thrust by the state into a predetermined social political class. It's an insidious uh, system. And the state makes all the major decisions in life for you, where you live, habitation, education, profession, ration. The state determines who lives and prospers during a national emergency and who fades away and dies, or who is imprisoned, tortured, or what? for merely trying to survive by escaping to China. So the distinction between economic rights and political rights are not really discernible in the DPRK. Once you are born as a victim of political discrimination, more likely than not, you will become a victim of economic discrimination. And if you are apprehended and detained and beaten and tortured, you are rendered twice doubly a victim of extreme political repression. So it's a false argument to say North Korea needs food, let's be nice, let's give them food aid, when we know it's been well documented that North Korea under Kim Jong-il, during the height of the famine, diverted food aid, blocked the delivery of food aid to some parts of North Korea, namely in the northeastern region, until mid-1997. And as Marcus Noland and Stephen Haggard in their 2007 book on the famine note, the regime's culpability, quote, the regime's culpability in this vast misery elevates the North Korean famine to crime against humanity, page 209. What then should be our approach to North Korea today? First, we have to get over a major stumbling block, the Kim Yo-jong dictated gag law. There are many misperceptions about this law, which took effect last week on March 30th. Um, let me just draw your attention to five points in descending order of weirdness. That is the most weird and troubling uh, I'll address first, which is, I know um, the anti to call the law anti leaflet law is not a formal, um, that's not the formal wording, but people do. And that creates misperceptions. The law does not just ban anti DPRK leaflets, propaganda leaflets. And you can argue, one can argue whether these, you know, to what degree sending um, leaflets into North Korea is effective. Under the rubric of leaflets, which six, over 60% of South Koreans oppose, actually, and you can see polls from seven years ago, 10 years ago, it's remained consistent. The majority of South Korean people think sending leaflets into North Korea is troublesome, it's troublemaking, it's not effective, so they are opposed to it. But 
this preponderant focus on the leaflets themselves creates the misperception that this law pertains only to sending leaflets. The most insidious aspect of this law is that the drafters and supporters of the law justify criminalizing free speech and sending virtually everything under the sun into North Korea, not just leaflets, but anything that has any exchange value into North Korea. They justify it as security, protecting lives. If activists near the border, if they endanger the lives and the physical integrity, the security of border town, Korean, South Korean residents, then the state will take action, so the law states. What does that mean? North Korea occasionally threatens to shoot at the activists. They have never shot at the activists or at the balloons themselves. There is this misleading narrative put forward by the South Korean government vigorously that on October 10th, party founding day in 2014, we came to the brink of war with North Korea, that North Korean guards shot at the balloon activists and the balloons themselves and South Korea shot back. It is simply not true. The balloons were launched in the morning. Several hours later, North Korea made a statement by shooting in the direction of the launch site. No one was killed, no one was hurt. Almost two hours later, South Korea shot back after giving North Korea two warnings. Both were a political statement. Now, it is a dangerous situation, of course, but there are existing laws that the South Korean police or military officers could use to prevent balloon launchers from launching the balloons if they see if they determine that this is uh, likely endangering the lives of civilians. But under this justification, if people do something that may endanger the lives of the South Koreans, then we will detain these activists and send them to jail. That is condoning North Korean violence. It's unwittingly inviting North Korean violence and exonerating North Koreans who may in the future shoot at South Koreans. If you read the amendment, um, Article 4, Paragraph 5, the ban pertains to leaflets, etc., which is defined as printed materials, leaflets, um, cash, and, quote, other means of property gains. End quote. That's the Ministry of Unification wording, official English translation. Other means of property gains. What does that mean? It really means anything under the sun. We know that North, North Korean human rights activists send, put in those balloons, amenities, basic goods like a pair of socks, uh, toothpaste, toothbrush, $1 US dollar bill, transistor radios, copies of the Bible, books, and so on. So Anything with any exchange value, if you send into North Korea, you may become uh, convicted of a crime going forward. Another uh, weird aspect is that the main drafter of this law, his name is Song Young Gil, he's the chairman of the South Korean National Assembly Committee on Foreign Affairs. Mr. Song published an op ed in the Korea Herald on December 13th, 2020 and actually argued that uh, sending money news into North Korea will further endanger the lives of the North Korean people because it will intensify, quote, intensify the North Korean government's crackdown on news and money. Therefore, this is actually, this law is pro-North Korea human rights. Um, it is a proposition that I strongly disagree with. Fourth, the law states that it bans sending leaflets, etc., anything, to North Korea via a third country. What the drafter, Mr. Song, and others had in mind was, of course, cracking down on arresting, deterring, and arresting people who may uh, launch, disseminate information into North Korea from the Chinese side of the border. Now, after a global backlash, uh, the South Korean government has backtracked and said, no, we don't mean that. 
uh, that's according to Chinese law, whether people send stuff into North Korea or not. We mean actually leaflets that end up in North Korea, launched from South Korea via tidal and air currents. Well, if you look at the map of the Korean Peninsula, the weather gods would have to create a miracle for anything sent from South Korea to go through China or Russia or Japan and end up in North Korea. What the draft to seek is to terrorize human rights activists from doing things like, I don't know, throwing a bundle of newspaper or leaflets into the DPRK mission in London or Madrid, doing anything that displeases North Korea. The final point is, this is a fact. We know that the first sister of North Korea, Kim Il-jung, issued a written statement at 6.14 a.m. on June 4th, 2020, referring to human rights activists as mongrel dogs, human scum, calling for a bill to ban this farce, she said. 16 minutes later, 16 minutes, four hours and 16 minutes later at 10.30, the Blue House issued a statement saying the leaflets do no good and all harm. At 10.40, the Unification Ministry chief spokesman called for a press conference and stated, yes, we will prepare such a bill. This is caving into blackmail, which will only beget further blackmail. This is an assault on basic freedoms of all Koreans in the North and the South, the basic freedom to impart, share, and send uh, information, regardless of borders, regardless of the medium. It is a dangerous law that would further endanger the lives of South Korean citizens and deprive the most oppressed people on earth of the basic right to seek information. It's anti-humanitarian, anti-religion, anti-freedom of speech, anti-freedom of the press. It must be repealed. Let me stop there. Professor Lee, Professor Fahey, you're such amazing thought leaders. Uh, I will make my remarks very brief. Um, thank you. 31 years ago, the people of South Korea brought me over to be the first Romanian ever to study in South Korea. I'm a grateful uh, naturalized American right now. Uh, I, I, I do have a duty to the people of, of Korea, not only South Korea, but also North Korea. We do have a duty to them. And I'm so grateful to so many of my mentors. Of course, first and foremost, my mother, who's on this program right now, whose uh, memoirs I have read. Amazing, amazing piece, yes. To you, Yoon, thank you. Uh, you've been such a great professor and mentor. You know, all of the other board members, Dave Maxwell, Professor Maxwell, uh, John Dupre, Pastor Robert King, Mark Nolan, um, Dr. Nimago Natileke, um, and, and so many others were on this call. Um, we really owe it to the people of both South and North Korea to make things right. And, and South Korea used to be, until this administration, I'm sorry, my, you know, I'm, I'm going to speak up right now. My seniors uh, from Seoul Nash University and other great Korean friends that I have have always told me, do not, do not ever get involved in Korean politics. But what do I do when I see a government that cracks down on North Korean human rights defenders? What do I do when I see a government that cracks down on North Korean human rights groups? What am I to do? just stand idly by. South Korea used to be such a great defender of North Korean human rights at the United Nations. And Ambassador Robert King has joined us today. Uh, he has always been such a great, great defender of human rights, of course, in North Korea and elsewhere as well. Uh, and, and, and we recall how the Republic of Korea, South Korea, used to, to be an, an active player together with the United States, with the European Union, with uh, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and others. 
Uh, regrettably, under the administration of President Moon Jae-in, uh, this hasn't happened. And it, 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 as Professor Lee was saying, we have witnessed uh, unfortunate events and occurrences where North Korean escapees were forcibly repatriated to conditions of danger, to certain death. Uh, we, we, we have seen a, a South Korean government that has not co-sponsored significant action at the UN, at the UN Human Rights Council or the General Assembly, uh, this cannot continue. This is absolutely unacceptable. And we do have to speak up. And although I have learned my, my career rule 101 from, from Professor Lee and Professor Fahey and other great friends, uh, we really have to speak up. Um, South Korea and the people of South Korea have to understand that these are their brothers and sisters uh, who are living under the yoke of a tyrannical regime. And I owe it to you, my dear friends. I owe it to my mother who's listening right now and to my other great mentors to, to make sure that we do fight this tyrannical regime. Um, so, um, you know, once again, I'm very grateful for you joining us today. We have uh, quite a few great questions. Uh, thank you. You are the epitome uh, of the, the concerned scholar. Both you, Professor Lee, and you, Professor Fahey. Again, when I hear this question, who cares in the academic community? Well, you do. You have written so many articles, so many books about this, and I thank you. So right now we are ready to move on to our Q&A and we, we do have quite a few great questions. Um, Sandra, Professor Fahey, I think you're ready to take this first question from Timothy, uh, one of our own at HRNK. Could you please speak about the similarities and differences between the USA and Europe's approach to human rights in North Korea? What are some of the collaborative efforts uh, our two regions, the EU and the USA, have made to improve the situation of human rights in North Korea. Sandra, on to you. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, Timothy, thank you for that question. It's very important. North Korea has signed on to many of the international uh, human rights norms, so there ought not to be any difference in how North Korea understands uh, protects and respects human rights. But we know, as I mentioned, there's that kind of two-tier or two-faced approach, um, the front phase and the back phase, what they say is happening and what's actually happening in North Korea. So probably you're aware um, that North Korea claims that national sovereignty, protection of the nation state is the best way to then thus protect this, uh, the rights of its citizens absolutely untrue. I roll my eyes because it's just preposterous. That's the approach that North Korea takes. Um, you asking about similarities to American European approach to human rights in North Korea. Europe and many other countries actually take a far more engaged approach to North Korea. They have representatives, although we've seen in the last few weeks or months, perhaps it is, many um, diplomatic representatives exiting North Korea. So, you know, more countries have diplomatic engagement with North Korea than don't. But many people who are based in the United States are unaware of this. Uh, I'd say Canada and Europe take a, a more engaged approach. Canada sometimes takes a kind of quiet uh, approach to negotiations than what I see in the United States. Um, in terms of more collaborative efforts between the two regions, I'm not sure if I can actually answer that question with any assurance at the moment. So, uh, Timothy, maybe you can email me and I'll get back to you on that one. And perhaps if Professor Lee or uh, Greg, you'd like to answer that, I'll hand that over to you. Thank you, Sandra. And now we have a question from uh, Professor David Maxwell, our board member, great American, great American patriot and friend of Korea. Um, so, uh, Professor Maxwell is asking, is it difficult for those of us who take freedom and liberty for granted to understand why the Korean people in the North do not turn to political resistance, 
to throw off the yoke of oppression. Is it only because of the nature of the regime and the total control it wields over the people through Song Boon and through its total security control? Um, so uh, I hope that both of you can, can answer that question. Why is there no significant resistance in North Korea? I do have a second question from David Maxwell as well. So please go ahead. May I go first if I, sorry, <laughs> Professor Lee, everybody's probably dying to hear you, but I'd like to jump in on this one if I may. Um, Professor Maxwell, thank you so much for this very important question. And uh, it's one that drove me to South Korea to learn the Korean language so that I could interview North Koreans who had survived the famine of the 1990s. Um, you know, I had the mistaken belief, which I think many have, that oppressed individuals all bear resemblance to one another. Um, that if you are oppressed, then you sympathize with others who are oppressed. That's the first thing, and that's absolutely not true. Um, the second thing is that, you know, how are North Koreans understanding uh, resistance? How is revolution or resistance to oppression understood within North Korea? And so this gets us to the, the context of North Korea. Resistance is understood as resistance to the Japanese, the South Koreans, the Americans. I, when I was interviewing North Koreans who survived the famine, was shocked when I, and I kept pushing them because, you know, I was a PhD student and, and I was amazed and I had expected to find a certain answer and I wasn't finding it and this shocked me. I had expected them to be enraged at the leadership, at the government for causing the death of infants in the arms of fathers they weren't because they had been told over and over that the reason you're struggling, the reason you don't have anything to eat is because of the Americans, because of the South Koreans, because of the Japanese. Uh, I often say, you know, a fact uh, does not come with its meaning attached. So for instance, a beautiful bicycle from Japan, a beautiful refrigerator from South Korea or Japan entering into smuggled into North Korea I'd say to North Koreans, but when you saw that, didn't you think, well, how come we're not able to make something so nice? Or, well, this is clearly evidence that, you know, they have some skills that we don't have. And why don't we have those skills? North Koreans would say to me, well, we would be able to make such a nice refrigerator if we weren't persecuted by them. We would be able to make such nice bicycles if we weren't persecuted by them. And the second thing I'll say in relation to this question is, we have got to recall, North Koreans have had zero, zero self representation. North Koreans have never seen their own selves represented in media. We know in the West, anywhere, how important it is to have representation. When Barack Obama was elected, young black boys thought, oh, I can do this too. When we have Kamala Harris in office, young uh, brown girls can think, oh, I can do this too. The fact that I am speaking on this panel as a woman, other women, young girls will think, oh, I can do that too. Representative uh, representation is incredibly powerful. North Koreans have never seen themselves, I would argue since 1910 when the Japanese came. And then since 1945, the founding of the country, the, there is no free media, they have not had any representation. So how the famine is understood, how the situation in North Korea is understood has curtailed the ability for people to um, imagine a different way of life. I'll leave it there, thanks. Professor Lee. Thank you for those insights, Professor Fahi. Um, very insightful and articulate as ever. Uh, I guess the reason that there has been no civil protest movement in North Korea is simply because the DPRK is the most perfected, the most advanced totalitarian state in world history. I guess North Korea's crimes against humanity committed against its civilian population now going into entering its eighth decade throughout the entire sweep of the political existence of the DPRK are so overreaching, so sweeping, so intrusive, so terrifying that people have not been able to, let alone band together and demand more of the government, even complain about life in in everyday life, you know, to your neighbor or to your colleague. If you do those, there's a chance you might just disappear with your entire family. So 
crimes against humanity, we know, mean the following per uh, the Rome Statute, Chapter 7 of the Rome Statute of the ICC, systematic and widespread attack against a civilian population with knowledge of the attack, with full knowledge of what the state is doing, what kinds of attack, murder, enslavement, extermination, forcible deportation, movement of a population, torture, attacks against political groups, racial, ethnic, gender, uh, religious groups, uh, disappearance of person, crimes of sexual nature, and so on. But the UN Commission of Inquiry report of 2014, again, uh, makes a contribution to international legal studies, I'm being facetious here, by pointing out that the regime at the highest state level is also guilty of the serious crime of, quote, knowingly causing prolonged starvation, a policy of, quote, deliberate mass starvation. And in that report, the section on North Korea's violation, the state's violation of the right to life, um, the right to food and other related aspects of the right to life, pages 144 to 208, is um, startling in ways that are quite novel. We as a society have grown somewhat immune to, inured to horrific stories of even extermination, murder, wholesale murder, imprisonment, torture, because we've seen it repeatedly in our lifetime in history as well. But we have not seen a state that has engaged over the course of some five years in a policy of deliberate mass starvation against a segment of its population. It is a novelty. It is a novel idea. And uh, if we are able to raise awareness on this uh, uniquely weird and atrocious aspect of North Korean, the North Korean state, perhaps it may resonate more with the younger generation with the public at large, people may take more interest in, uh, in the North Korean uh, regime, the nature of the regime, the kind of state, uniquely, uniquely cruel state that the DPRK is. And that applies to North Koreans as well. As Professor Fahi said, defectors, victims of famine and political repression don't fully realize why they were victims. They don't fully realize that the state above anything else beyond the United States, beyond Japan, that the DPRK state is the culprit. But then, you know, that kind of false narrative also resonates among some circles outside North Korea in free countries where some people argue that bad weather, climate change, natural disasters, and U.S. sanctions cause the famine and are responsible for the hunger, the food situation, the abject poverty, uh, of the North Korean people, although they are unable to answer this wonder, this miracle of nature that is manifested every year without fail in that climate change stops right at the border with China and South Korea. There's no one starving in China or South Korea. Well, thank you both for the terrific answers. Uh, I'm going to go to Oliver Jia of uh, NK News next. Uh, Oliver is wondering about um, the issue of uh, abductees, in particular Japanese abductees. Uh, the family members of the abductees are mostly elderly. Many of them have already passed away. Is there anything the international community can do to pressure Pyongyang to repatriate the abductees? And this question goes to both of you, Sandra and Yoon, because you've both been very deeply involved in this issue. So may I take the liberty of going to Sandra first? This is the issue that comes up often between Japan and North Korea. It's quite interesting because South Korea has many who are abducted far more, in fact. So it's very interesting how, again, we see uh, South Korea being very quiet, acquiescing even in terms of the crimes that are committed against its people on the peninsula. 
In terms of Japan, uh, you know, here we are on Zoom engaging and speaking with each other without any kind of difficulty, except perhaps the, the time zone issue, which isn't present between North Korea and Japan. There ought to be no reason why, if they can't physically reunite these relatives, that they couldn't virtually reunite these individuals. So if there's no practical reason that we can see, what then could be the ideological reason? And it is because North Korea would have to prep these individuals and make sure to be mindful of what they say and what they don't say and all of these other sorts of control issues. So absolutely, this is a huge problem. Uh, I'll leave it up to Yoon to, to discuss, or Professor Lee, pardon me, to discuss how we can resolve this issue. I mean, for me, it's just preposterous that North Korea could even claim the denial of these things, it's so unfair, it's so unjust, it's such a, um, a barometer of North Korea's cruelty, an unnecessary cruelty in keeping these family members apart as they age and, and things like that. You, Oliver, perhaps you heard as I was speaking earlier that there are these limitations on post. So many individuals from North Korea have not even been able to post letters to their relatives in Japan and vice versa. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is a heartbreaking issue. I, Turn it over to Professor Lee. Thank you, uh, Oliver, for that question. Uh, when Prime Minister Koizumi visited Japan and met with Kim Jong il on September 17, 2002, the Prime Minister did not know that Kim Jong il would inform him that of the 13 uh, abductees that Kim Jong il owned up to, that eight were reportedly dead. That's what Kim told Koizumi, and this became a political issue in Japan. Uh, it backfired for both Koizumi in the short term, but in the long term for North Korea. Kim Jong-il assumed that he could get away with it, but the story was not credible because most of these people, the unaccounted eight, were people in their 40s and 50s, uh, relatively healthy and so on. And as of 2004, when North Korea sent back the purported remains of Yokota Megumi, and the Japanese found the remains of animals, as well as uh, males, uh, men, uh, in the sample, uh, North Korea's story became even less credible. Japan is correct to address this issue, and some may grumble, well, we're talking about 12 people unaccounted for, um, the eight plus uh, the four that additional four that the North Korean government denies having abducted. What's more important, security from North Korea's nuclear weapons that could kill hundreds of thousands of people or the fate of what happened to those 12 poor abductees? This is again uh, in, uh, in line with the false statement, the false use of the hungry North Korean child that the South Korean various South Korean governments have used in the past and that the current Moon administration uses. Uh, they, like that, it is a false argument. It presumes that pushing North Korea on the abductee issue or human rights at large may you know, be a stumbling block to progress on peace, rapprochement, denuclearization, and all those good things. And it passively then condones North Korea's crimes against humanity, state-sponsored terrorism. The world must not condone that. And when the time is right, when Kim Jong-un, when the North Korean leadership decides to re-engage Japan in negotiations, uh, in talks for the normalization of diplomatic relations as they happened to place in the 1990s, that would be the occasion for Japan to try to push North Korea on coming clean on what happened to Japanese abductees. But for now, the world should support Japan's campaign, cooperate with, collaborate with Japanese NGOs, the Japanese government, the European Union, the United States, and uh, in due course, perhaps the Republic of Korea as well, in raising awareness on this issue and the broader issue of North Korea's crimes against humanity. Those oh, past and ongoing crimes of the past and those that are ongoing this very day. Well, thank you very much, uh, you and Sandra. Uh, I, I do have a question from our fellow traveler, uh, Terence Matsuo, um, on another very important issue 
Um, how do you evaluate the state of inter-Korean family reunions? What role do Korean Americans play in that process? What actions can Washington, Seoul, and even Pyongyang take to um, ensure that these reunions do take place? Uh, this is an issue with a, a clear expiration date. Unfortunately, we're talking about um, senior citizens. So, uh, Sandra Yoon, please go ahead. Um, Professor Lee, I've gone first so many times. Would you like to go first or I'm happy to? Sure. Um, so this is a misnomer, family reunion, separated family reunion events. It is a reunion in that it lasts over the course of one or two days, two nights and three days at most, chaperoned by North Korean agents, paid for by the South Korean government entirely, and then it's goodbye forever. The two sides who meet for the first time in 60, 70 years, they cannot write letters to each other. North Korea does not allow letter correspondence, telephone conversation. It's hello, nice to meet you, goodbye forever, good luck. There's really an element of cruelty in this political theater. I can certainly understand for those concerned, it's still better than nothing. It's deeply emotional, deeply moving for a 95 year old mother who's not seen her daughter in 50 years to be reunited for a couple of days. But we should do more, we can do more. We should ask more of the DPRK, not merely settle for such um, quasi uh, reunion meetings. You know, a prison visit in some ways is more personal and more meaningful than these uh, meetings that are more a political show for the world, for the government's concern than uh, real meaningful reunions. And I can certainly understand that many Korean Americans are keen on seeing their families in North Korea, even for one day or two days. But the United States government, uh, when it does take up this important issue, and I support those who advocate for the US government taking up this issue of facilitating Korean Americans to see their family members in North Korea. The, you know, the United States government should do more than just settling for hello and goodbye forever, reunion meeting, so-called. I'll just add one point to that. Um, Professor Lee, that's so um, well said. Thank you so much. Um, you know, a lot of us within academia have heard this term biopolitics, you know, the biology and politics combining. And these family reunions are that kind of bi biopolitics par excellence. Watch how North Korea uses, sustains the life of, or kills foreigners or North Koreans. North Koreans who want to defect, shot at the border, right? But the minute they're in China or elsewhere, oh, get them back, get them back in order to kill them, get them back to put them on propaganda videos, et cetera, et cetera. North Korea doesn't care for its people. It only cares for how it can make use of their very being. So those who are in America who have ties with the North Korean, uh, the Northern part of the peninsula in terms of Korean ethnicity, I would continue to push, if you can, for human rights in North Korea. Uh, not for peace on the peninsula, because this is a whole other issue that doesn't really make sense. But for the human rights of their fellows in North Korea, this is the most important thing. We have to very strategically push. Someone asked a question earlier about how can we really make North Korea care about human rights. We have to very strategically push for the hardest aspects. So for instance, access to the prison camps, what's happening in the prison camps, access to the orphanages in the northern part of the peninsula, and really see what's going on there. Well, that's terrific. Thank you so much. Uh... Let me take the liberty of asking two more questions. One comes from uh, Chad Miller. What actions might be taken by the international community 
to pressure Sol into reinstating access to HANA-1 for NKDB and other human rights organizations to resume interviewing North Korean defectors to provide a more recent assessment on the state of human rights in North Korea, very important tactical question. Uh, access has been cut off. This is what the Moon government has been doing in South Korea. Uh, the other question comes from uh, my colleague Rick Hersevoort in the Netherlands. Do you think increased engagement with, the, with North Korea or the DPRK would also help advance the human rights situation in the country? Or would this further legitimize Kim Jong-un and his regime, his empty promises? Would this boost his image internationally and domestically? Question to both of you, and we're going to make these two the final questions of the day. Thank you. I'll jump in and answer very quickly. Chad Miller, thank you for this question. It's great. Uh, North Korea restricts access. It does something which I call access without access. Now we see South Korea is doing the same thing. In fact, South Korea is just giving no access whatsoever. So, you know, this crackdown that we're seeing in South Korea, I think is, as Professor Lee so eloquently expressed, dictated by North Korea. And why is it happening? It's happening because I believe we are at the most critical point in terms of North Korean human rights, which is because of the technology we have and because of the amount of voices. We have many defectors who are on YouTube who are speaking in English, a very powerful uh, language globally, it, getting their message out there. So South Korea and uh, North Korea are wanting to crack down on this. There's other ways of getting access to information in North Korea. So I mentioned Rim Jin Gang of Asia Press. So activists and scholars can, can continue to, to find other means in the meantime. I would encourage Europe, Canada, uh, the United States to continue to put pressure on South Korea to enable activist groups and North Korea database and KDB to get access to these, group, uh, these individuals in Hana One because they provide such, wealthy, uh, such a wealth of information. And uh, I'll leave it there. Thanks. NKN, NK Database has been doing wonderful work for the past at least 15 years and has become one of the many over 100 uh, casualties organizations targeted by the South Korean government in various ways and now blocking NK uh, DB's access to Hanawon, the uh, primary um, education facility for North Korean defectors from interviewing North Korean defectors. This is, this is a travesty, as are the many other politically motivated pretextual tax audits, harassment, revocation of operating licenses, targeting prominent North Korean defector human rights activists are as well. So this should be a package of, um, it should be an agenda in future talks between the US Special Representative for Human Rights in North Korea, whoever the person will be, they should raise this issue directly with South Korea. So should the liberal countries of Western Europe, so should Japan. Human rights has to remain on the agenda not just political issues, economic issues, human rights issues. Human rights issues have become, as we know, a legitimate issue in international relations, interstate relations, in addition to the more traditional issues like diplomacy, political relations, waging war, economic relations. The fact that we, as a person, as a community, a society, a nation state, that we have the right to be concerned about how another sovereign state treats its citizens. This is legitimate and compelling discourse. What the South Korean government has been doing, there's been a crescendo in crackdown on human rights organizations, as we, as we all know, since Kim Yo-jong's statement of June 4th. In July, many things happened, as we know, the revocation of the operating license of the uh, prominent Park brothers and other 
uh, many acts of harassment against dozens of human rights organizations in South Korea. Uh, where does all this lead? You know, how will we remember the Moon administration's North Korea policy, its crackdown on activists? This is something that a message that needs to be conveyed to uh, President Moon himself, the Blue House, in President Moon's remaining time in office. Well, Professor Lee and Professor Fahey, thank you so much. Uh, you, you're such great thought leaders and you have been training so many generations of young people, uh, young scholars. Uh, many of them come to us as uh, HRNK interns and I, I thank you for that. So um, again, uh, words cannot express my gratitude for what you do. Thank you so much for joining us for this very significant, meaningful HRNK program. I look forward to staying in touch and to uh, discussing and debating the issues we, uh, we all care about. So thank you. And uh, we'll continue to be in touch. Thank you for all. Honorable applause to both of you.